Welcome to this Reuters Newsmaker with climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe. I'm Simon Robinson, the Global Managing Editor at Reuters. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the places where we live. She's an endowed professor in the Department of Political Science at Texas Tech University. She hosts the US PBS digital series, Global Weirding, and she has been named the United Nations Champion of the Environment, one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, and a Climate Ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. Joining me to ask the questions today is Reuters Climate Change Editor, Katie Adigal. And just before we start, I want to remind everyone uh, that there is the possibility of answering, uh, asking questions in the chat function. Um, we'll get to those questions later on. First, welcome, Catherine. Thanks for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. I want to jump in and ask a little bit about weather. So over the last couple of years, we've seen all sorts of unprecedented uh, weather events, um, record heat waves, extreme flooding. We've got the fires earlier this year in, in Australia and obviously more recently in, in the west coast of the US. All of these weather events that we hear about um, every day, is that climate change? Weather is what happens on a single day or week or month or even year. Climate is the long-term average statistics of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. To put it another way, weather is like your mood and climate is like your personality. So does that mean that we can't say anything about heat waves and hurricanes and wildfires? No, we can. We know that their statistics over climate timescales are in fact changing. We know that heat waves are getting much more extreme. We know that wildfires are burning greater and greater area. We know that hurricanes are not getting more frequent, but they're getting bigger and stronger with a lot more rainfall associated with them. And our heavy rain events are increasing too. And we know these are all happening because of our warming world. So, I mean, we've, we've had obviously um, uh, wild weather in the past. But um, why, uh, how can we be sure that the climate change is really changing things? How, how, how do we know that these sort of things didn't happen a century ago, two centuries ago? Well, most of them absolutely did. 99% of the time, it's something that has happened sometime in the past. But what we see is it's happening much more frequently than we would expect it to, or it's stronger or longer or more intense than we would expect. The way I think about it is this. We always have a pair of dice. And so we have a chance of rolling a double six naturally. So naturally, you can have a heat wave, a hurricane, a wildfire, a storm, a drought. All of those things happen naturally. But as the planet warms decade by decade by decade, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking one of those numbers on the dice and turning it into another six. And then another six, and then a seven. And so you're rolling the dice and you're starting to see a lot more double sixes pop up and even the occasional double seven. And you say, how could the city of Houston, for example, have three 500 year flood events in just a few years? You're only supposed to have one of those on average every 500 years. How could Europe have three 500 year heat waves in 15 years? You're only supposed to have you know, one or two in 500 years. Uh, so that's what we see happening, and that's how we know that climate change is basically exacerbating our weather. And scientists are being able to put numbers on it now. This is at the cutting edge of climate science. It's called attribution, and when we look at a specific event, we are starting to be able to calculate how much more likely climate change made it, you know, how much more likely we were to roll that double six or double seven, or how much stronger climate change made it, or how much more intense or damaging. So let me give you two examples. Hurricane Harvey devastated Houston just over three years ago. We know now that it's estimated that almost 40% of the rain that fell during that event would not have occurred if the exact same hurricane had happened 100 years ago, which it easily could have. The Galveston hurricane in 1900 hit the area just south of Houston, and it was the most, um, the highest mortality rate, I think, of any hurricane in the U.S. because people had no warning, they didn't even know it was coming. Then we know that out west there's wildfires, and without a changing climate, we would have seen about 11 million acres burned by wildfires since the 1980s. With a changing climate, we've seen almost 25 million acres burned instead. 
That's how climate change is loading the dice against us. And there's a fantastic new book that just came out. Uh, it's called Angry Weather. And it's by one of the top scientists in this field, Ferdy Otto. And it's a very easy book to read book. It's not for scientists. It's for anybody who wants to understand this. And it really lays out in simple terms how we know climate change is weighting the dice against us. I'd like to ask a question uh, that I'm curious about as a journalist as well. The climate beat and climate science and everything you're describing often is described as just doom, right? I'm a journalist of doom. Um, but you are known as being, you know, remarkably upbeat and, mm -hmm. and you know, in, 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 also when you're you're facing resistance from from critics who say that climate change is a hoax, how do you stay upbeat? Um, and and what have there been any challenging moments where you know you're trying to convey a lesson and it's not getting through? Well, I can tell you that the science does not give me much hope at all. When we look at every new scientific study that comes out, it's saying that things are changing faster or to a greater extent than we thought. Sea levels rising faster. The Antarctic is melting, melting faster. Wildfires are burning greater area. And many times we scientists have a tendency to under rather than overestimate the magnitude of these impacts. So I do not see my hope there. But without that hope of a better future, why are we doing what we're doing? I'm not talking about passive hope where we just say, oh, I hope it will get better, but there's nothing I can do. And I'm not talking about a sort of bury my head in the sand hope, like, oh, if I close my eyes, maybe it will go away. I'm talking about exactly the opposite type of hope, a rational hope that's informed by how bad this is and how great the challenges that we face, but an active hope that says the only way we're going to get to a better future is if we roll up our sleeves and dig in and make it happen. We need system-wide change to fix this thing, but a system is made up of individuals. And we know time and again through history that individuals have been able to be turning points in their community, in their organization, in their schools or universities, in their churches or places of worship, at the level of their city or their state or even their country and the world. Our history, the his human history, is made up of memorable names and those were all individual people who made a difference. So what I do is I actively cultivate a practice of hope because if not, I think I'd just be in bed with the covers pulled up over my head six days out of seven. <laughs> And how I do that is I go out and I look for hopeful things. I myself study the difference that we see between a future where we continue on our current pathway versus one where we make big changes. And there's a huge difference between those two futures. I look for people who are doing hopeful things, especially in unexpected ways. I love hearing about um, what kids are doing. I love hearing about what people who would be, consider themselves politically conservative are doing, or people of faith across the spectrum, what they're doing. I love hearing about new technologies, about how big corporations like Microsoft and Apple are going carbon neutral, and what's happening even at the level of cities. So. Ironically, the city of Houston had its Climate Action Week on the third year anniversary of Harvey, and they were announcing both a plan to meet their Paris targets, and Houston's one of the biggest cities in the country, and it's home to many of the oil and gas corporations. So they were announcing that they would meet their Paris tar targets in terms of reducing their emissions. They would implement an adaptation plan to be better prepared for the impacts of a changing climate, and Houston Climate Week was canceled after the first day as another hurricane rolled ashore. Oh. But even still, the fact that if Houston, the home of the oil and gas industry, is meeting its Paris targets, is preparing for a changing climate, surely that must give us hope. You know, you don't just study climate change, you're alluding to this now, but you also study the science of, of climate communication, how we humans understand this challenge before us. And, you know, what are you finding in that area and, and what, if anything, is getting in our way of really wrapping our head around it? I do study that and I have been trying to read as much as I can about psychology and neuroscience and the way that our brain interacts with information because the barriers to climate action don't lie in a lack of scientific facts. We've known since the 1850s that digging up and burning coal back then, 
and oil and natural gas more today, we know that it produces heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around our planet. And we know that's the only reason we're warming. According to natural factors, we should be very gradually, but inevitably getting cooler right now. Instead, we're getting warmer faster than any time in the history of human civilization on this planet. So when you look at this information, often we feel like this is scary. We have to do something about it. So there's a book that David Wallace Wells wrote a couple of years ago called The Uninhabitable Earth. It was a New York Times bestseller, and he lays out just how bad this is. And he and I have talked about it, and he said, when I found out all the, these, these facts, I realized I had to do something, so I wrote this book. So what he had there was his awareness of the urgency was coupled with the ability to act. He felt what they call efficacy, the ability or the empowerment to act. He was able to do something about it. But then a friend of mine was in, um, in the train in California, and he saw this man reading this David's book on the train. So he said, excuse me, what do you think of the book? So the man said, well, you know, I've always been concerned about climate change, but now I'm even more concerned about it, and I feel completely hopeless. There's really nothing we can do. <laughs> so in that case, there was no sense of efficacy. And for many of us, scaring the pants off us, for most of us, doesn't move us forward, it actually causes us to freeze. That's how our brains are hardwired. We are wired to move forward, not only to escape fear, but rather towards a reward, something positive. So talking, first of all, not just about the ice caps, but about what's happening where we live to decrease our psychological distance to the issue, that's one of the first most important things we can talk about. And then the second one is talking about positive practical solutions to counter our solution aversion, because 99% of the problem is solution aversion. We don't think there's anything we can do to fix it. And then the extra 1% is psychological distance. We don't think it matters to us. It matters to future generations or polar bears or people who live far away, but not people here today. So addressing those two issues are the most important issues, not hitting people upside the head with facts we've, we've known for 150 years, but showing them why it matters to them in the places where they live and what people are already doing to help fix this problem, to show that, yes, we can act and we can make a difference. Catherine, let's stick with the, uh, the, the idea of communicating. Next week, we have the first uh, debate in the US election campaign. And the uh, Democratic candidate has uh, talked a lot about climate change, maybe more than, than in previous uh, elections, although this is a very unusual campaign, obviously. Why do you think it's becoming more something that, that a lot of politicians talk about now? So in the last federal election, I don't believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there was a single question asked of the candidates of climate change, was there? I think during the debates, that it was noted that there were none. I think that's right. And people would say, why is that? It's because of the issue of psychological distance. Again, if we view it as an issue that is far off in space, so other side of the world, not here, far off in time, future generations, not us, and, and this is important, far off in relevance. So it matters to people who would call themselves an environmentalist or people who would call themselves a tree hugger, but it doesn't matter to me if I'm not that type of person, we think. Of course, the truth is to care about climate change, we only have to be one thing. And that's a human living on this planet. As far as I'm aware, most of us are that. But we have this sense that it doesn't matter to us. So what's changing? What's changing is the chickens are coming home to roost. The dice are being loaded against us to an extent where you can't miss it anymore. A couple of years ago, I was standing in line to pick up my son from Sunday school at church. I live in a very conservative part of the country. The last time they studied this, they found that Lubbock, Texas was the second most conservative city in the US after Provo, Utah. When there's an election, there's a Republican candidate and then there's a conservative Republican candidate talking about how liberal the Republican is. So here I am standing in line to pick up my son at Sunday school. And the man behind me, who I, I knew sort of, he turned to me and said, do you think that the weather is just getting weirder? He said, I've lived here for 30 years and something is different. I just know it is. Is that right? I said, yeah, you're absolutely right. So our eyes are seeing the wildfires burn 
millions of acres. We are living through unprecedented, almost biblical floods. We're seeing hurricanes pounding our coastlines much stronger than they should be otherwise. We're seeing temperatures in Siberia over 100 degrees. And so we are starting to realize that, yes, this is not just a future issue. This is a here issue and a now issue. And in fact, as of last year, the Yale Program on Climate Communication, which tracks public opinion on climate change, they found that almost 60% of people in the U.S. were either alarmed or concerned about climate change. And that was a significant increase. In fact, it was the largest number that they ever found in over a decade of polling. You know, I want to follow up on that. Um, if, I'm curious about the, the idea that you introduced the disconnect Mm -hmm. And um, and how you how you you reach common ground with people, or how how you communicate these challenges um, when when you know people are resisting and there's a gulf between understanding and acceptance. What what works for you? <laughs> In, well, you know, in Lubbock, it's, you know, especially in Texas. Oh yes, I've had thousands of conversations, and I can tell you what works in 90% of the cases. But first I wanna explain why 90%. It's because we aren't just yes or no on this issue. So often we characterize people on climate change as believers or deniers. And I don't like either of those words. First of all, because climate change is not a religion. We use our minds to look at the data and decide what's happening. And second of all, because the word denier does definitely draw a line in the sand. It's often used to emphasize what divides us rather than what unites us. And while there are certainly some people who that label does apply, I have seen it applied many times to people who would, it would not necessarily apply to. And what it does is it just separates people further and it just ends the dialogue right there. Instead, I prefer the term that the six Americas of global warming uses. This is another uh, study from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. And what they found is that people aren't just in one group or the other we fall into one of six groups across the spectrum. So the first group is people who are alarmed. Then we have people who are concerned. And together, alarmed and concerned make up 58% of the population. Like I said, almost 60%. Then we have people who are cautious and they often lead with their doubts. So they get mistaken for being a denier, but they just wanna know, how do we know it is human? Is there any solution other than destroying the economy? Then there's people who are disengaged. They've been living under a rock for the last 10 years, and they're about, I don't know, 6 or 7% of the population. Um, then we have people who are very, very doubtful. But then at the very end, we have 10% who are, and this is, I think, the perfect word for it, dismissive. And that number has not changed. People who are dismissive will dismiss anything and everything that conflicts with their identity. And to them, rejecting climate science and rejecting climate change is part of their identity because they don't see any actions that could be taken that they wouldn't perceive to be a direct threat on themselves or something they value. So a dismissive will dismiss thousands of scientists, tens of thousands of scientific studies, 150 years of science, in fact, my personal definition of a dismissive is someone who, if an angel from God appeared before them with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real on foot high letters of flame, they would dismiss them too. So why would I think that I could change a dismissive's mind? I don't think I can. I honestly think it takes a miracle. And I feel like I've, I've seen maybe two or three miracles in 10 years, but I didn't have anything to do with it. They just sort of happened. So leaving aside that 90%, and believe me, I know it's hard because the 90% are the loudest. They comment on every article. They attack climate scientists online incessantly. I get one every single day. Some days I get 10 or 20 or 30 or 40. We all have an uncle or a cousin or an old college roommate or a brother-in-law or a neighbor. Every single one of us has someone like that in our lives. In fact, I've only ever found one person who didn't. Everybody else does. And we know they're dismissive if they bring up climate change like a sore tooth that they can't leave alone. Every conversation has to have something dragged into it, kicking and screaming about how, oh, Arctic ice is growing, not shrinking. Or I heard those scientists fake the data. Or that Green New Deal is just a socialist communist plot to take over the world. You know what I'm talking about. So with somebody who's dismissive, 
if it's in a public forum or if there's anybody else listening, I just simply say, no, that's not right and give them a brief response. But if we're, try- I don't bother to try to change their mind because 90% of us aren't dismissive. So for 90% of us, what does work? What works is beginning the conversation with something that we agree on rather than something we disagree on. And I realize this is the opposite of the way conversations happen on social media. On social media, it's always about what we disagree on first, and even in the media in general, probably. It's not good TV if you have three talking heads and they're all nodding along, right? Although I think we're mostly nodding along, yes? Okay. (laughs) But, you know, people would be more entertained if people were, you know, screaming and throwing things. But if we can begin with something we agree on, then we've established a mutual respect. We've established that we see each other as somebody with the right values, as somebody who cares about the same things we do. So instead of waving a bony finger of judgment at somebody, or instead of sort of implicitly saying, you don't have the right values, you need to fix yourself, you're a bad person, instead of saying, oh yeah, you like birding, I love birding too. Or, oh, you live in Texas, I live in Texas too. Great place to live. Or, you know, you're a Rotarian, I'm a Rotarian too. Um, You're a Christian or you're a Muslim, I am too, if you are. That's the key you really have to be. Um, And then connect the dots between who you are who they are too, and why you would care about climate change because of who you are. What, what are the areas that people generally agree on? You know, what are those topic areas that you find are always areas of agreement? Well, I don't think there is an always uh, because we're all very different people. Now, they have done some research. Ed Maybach at George Mason University is a public health and climate communication researcher, and he has found that the most generally applicable frame to talk to people if you really want to bond with people is one that will not surprise any of us in the year 2020, and that is our health. We do all care about our health. So when we talk about how climate change affects our health, not just through extreme heat, but through air pollution, through water pollution, through diseases carried by mosquitoes and ticks, um, through the the harm from increasing um, severe events like we talked about with wildfires and hurricanes. That is uh, sort of the, the most common general connector. But for each of us, we're all different people, right? And so that means that we can talk to other people who share our interests. But I have to say, Katie, this is the hardest part of every conversation because what I do, like when I give a presentation to say, you know, fellow scientists who they want to say, how do I do this? So say, okay, I will give you 10 examples. If you are a Rotarian, the four-way test that Rotarians ascribe to is the truth, is it fair? That totally fix climate, fix, fits climate change. If you are a birder, the Ottoman society has these maps of where birds are going to have to be forced to migrate to, to the point where iconic species like the Baltimore Oriole are no longer going to be native to Baltimore anymore. If you are a winter sports enthusiast, if you enjoy snow or ice, We know that the winter season is shrinking and that's affecting snowmobiling, ice fishing, the communities and the economies of many small rural areas in the US and Canada. It's affecting winter athletes. There's an organization called Protect Our Winters founded by an Olympic snowboarder to talk about how we still want snow. I've bonded with people over knitting or over cooking or over having kids or over just living in the same place and experiencing the same type of crazy weather. But when I give all these examples, afterwards, I always have people coming up to me and saying, okay, I listened to your 10 examples. I still don't get it. So this is the question I ask them. I say, well, what do you enjoy doing? And if they're a scientist, they usually say, science. (laughs) I say, of course, that's why we're scientists. But what else do you enjoy doing? So one man said, well, I've been trying to reach out to churches like I know you do, but I can't get my foot in the door. So what should I do? So I said, well, you know, start with the type of church or congregation that you attend. What, you know, what do you normally attend? He said, oh, I don't go anywhere. I'm an atheist. So I said, well, stop, just stop. You need to be doing something that you genuinely care about. So what do you do? And he said, well, science. (laughs) I said, well, do you hike? Are you part of any community organizations? Do you, and I went through all these things and he's like, no, 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 no. And finally it was like a penny dropped. He's like, I dive. I was like, yes, 
And he said, well, actually, I have a lot. I have some records of some deep dives. I said, well, the ocean is being affected by climate change. Don't divers need to know that? How about you reach out to some of the PADI certification programs in your area, some of the dive schools, offer to do free climate education for divers or do like tours where you could show people what's changing because of climate change. I'm not a diver, so I can't do that, but he could. So, and then another NASA scientist, he said, well, I don't know how to talk to my friends about this. I said, well, what do you do with your friends? And he said, I cook with them. We get together and we cook because we're all international. So we make different dishes. I was like, well, there you go. Climate change is affecting our food. It's decreasing the nutrient quality of many of our food staples around the world. It's affecting specialty crops like coffee and chocolate and wine and beer and all the things that we love and crave. So while you're cooking with your friends, talk about how climate change is affecting food. Whoever you are is the perfect person to have those conversations with people who share your interests, your values, your loves, aspects of your personality, things that you enjoy, things that you share. So actually, let me ask you guys, if you don't mind, um, what are, you know, maybe try to think of two things that you enjoy, that you love, that you're passionate about, that are important to you, that you feel like you could start a conversation with someone on? Skiing? Skiing, absolutely. Um, watching sport, probably, for me. Yes. My family. Uh, so... Now. Sorry? Hiking, trekking. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm mean, actually... This oh, sorry, another, so just a sorry. second, actually. Oh, Let me no, just go ahead. Yes. There. So did you know that they've had to actually put roofs on outdoor baseball stadiums and start air conditioning them now because it gets too hot in the summer in some places, like here in Texas now, it gets too hot. They've had to move practices earlier in the morning because it's too hot when they used to have them usually just after sunrise. And of course, with skiing, our winter snow season is getting shorter. So see how easy it is to just immediately connect the dots there. Yes. Um, I, wanna, I wanna let Simon ask a question actually, I've got. Yeah, let me jump in. Uh, so I'm gonna go from the kind of, in some ways, the connecting with individuals and, and, and finding reasons that they can, um, uh, help in a sense talk about climate change i want to go to um much more the international sphere and i want to ask so there are there are a couple of um interesting uh and in some ways um opposing um facts um earlier this week china committed to um to uh, uh, what they called uh becoming carbon neutral by the year 2060 which a lot of people um, pointed to and said this is one of the biggest steps in the last few years um, on, on at, the, at the kind of global level. At the same time, the day after the election, the US election in early November, on November 4, is meant to be the day that, that Washington and the US pulls out of the Paris Climate Agreement. How important are those kind of actions? Obviously, very different um, uh, actions, and we're not sure that the, uh, the election will be the result will be known on, on uh, November 4, but how, how important is it that Beijing and Washington uh, are taking steps? Is it is is kind of, you know, is any real global action on, on um, climate change doomed if they, they're not part of it? Well, just to make sure that we, we understand where we're talking about now, because there's a lot of misinformation going around about, you know, China does this or the US does that. And one of the favorite arguments I would say that I hear on social media is, why should the US do anything if China is doing nothing? But as you just pointed out, China is not doing nothing. They have more wind and solar energy than any other country in the world per person their emissions are far smaller than each person in the US. And if you look at cumulative carbon emissions, which is what climate responds to, cumulative carbon, you can picture like this. It's like we're putting a brick of carbon on a pile. One brick every month since the dawn of the industrial era. And over time, that brick has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, when we put that monthly brick on the pile, and it's huge now, the size of our screens, now, China is the largest contributor to today's brick that we put on month by month. But for many decades into the 2000s, in fact, the United States was the biggest contributor to our brick. So when you look at the whole pile and you weigh the whole pile of bricks, 
the U.S. is number one in terms of what country has put the most bricks on that pile. So that is why U.S. responsibility is so high because they are most responsible for the most carbon produced since the dawn of the industrial era. But on the other hand, China is increasing quickly and we all contribute, even countries like my home of Canada or like Norway that say, oh, we're just a small country. We just produce, you know, one and a half or 2% of the global total. Well, you add it all up and you get 100%. So every country does matter, but it's not just at the federal level. So much has been made of the fact that uh, President Trump announced that they would be withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. He announced it a long time ago, near the beginning of his term, but it isn't official, as you just said, until just before the election. And then, of course, if a different president is elected and he wants to continue uh, the commitment, it would just take a few more weeks. You have to file a notice, and then you could be let back in and sign it. But, so people say, well, does that mean that it's all over? No, because below the federal level, Cities and states, corporations, tribal nations, universities, uh, faith denominations, and more have agreed that they are still in on the Paris Agreement, like we were talking about with Houston earlier. Almost 50% of the U.S. is still in on the Paris Agreement. But, of course, we need all hands on deck, and that's why we need the federal government, too, because there's some who will not be on board with the, with the Paris Agreement until they have to do that, and the only way they do that is through federal policy. That leads me to a question I had about, you know, so many people ask me all the time, what can I personally do? Mm -hmm. um, individual contributions, you know, regular, everyday people, citizen action. What can people do? Um, you know, when we look at kind of the scale of the challenge, what can one person do? We look at this challenge and we, we ask ourselves, what can we do? Because again, that relates to hope, right? If we see a huge problem and we feel like there's nothing we can do to address it, then we despair and we dissociate from it. And we think eat, drink, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die if there's nothing we can do. So action is essential, but then we're told to change our light bulbs and recycle. And intuitively that doesn't, doesn't quite add up. The greatest challenge that civilization has ever faced and we can fix it by changing a light bulb, that doesn't quite make sense. But then we're told, oh, there's more. You can um, stop eating meat, stop flying and stop having children. And if you do these things, that will fix the problem. Now, do not get me wrong, of course, the more people we have, the more carbon we produce in rich countries, in poor countries, unfortunately, they produce so little carbon that it hardly matters. But education of women and girls in poor countries is absolutely essential because that's what actually empowers them to make their own choices regarding how many children to have, which is what we have the luxury of doing here. So we say, well, Flying is 3% of global emissions, and uh, animal agriculture is 14% of global emissions. So yes, those make a dent, but even if we did those things, it wouldn't even take care of 25% of the problem, not even 25%. Not to mention the fact that, remember I talked about earlier how our brains move forward for reward or for benefit, but they freeze for fear. So if all of our messages are don't, 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 it's like a 10 commandments of green living, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt definitely not, thou shalt never. <laughs> and if thou dost this, that, you know, thy will, thee will be shunned. <laughs> That's sort of the way we often feel today. Instead, what I've become increasingly convinced of and this is actually the title of my TED Talk, uh, is that using our voice to advocate for change at every level, bonding not just with individuals, but bonding with an organization over their values. Hey, let me help you see how you could save money by being more efficient. Let's talk about how we could improve our image as a university and attract more students by being a more sustainable campus. Let's talk about how we could actually transition to clean energy, and if you look at over more than a year or two, we'll end up saving more money by doing that. The Fort Hood, the biggest army base in the U.S., which of course is in Texas, they did exactly that. They installed wind and solar two years ago, and they're saving taxpayers $150 million. There is nothing wrong with that, but they're also cutting carbon, too. So bonding over those shared values can be done at every level 
with, you know, city council people, with elected officials at the state level. You have to get to know them, though. You can't go in waving that judgy, bony finger. You have to figure out what makes them tick, what incentivizes them, what they get really excited about, and then connect the dots between what they would get really excited about and climate change, not just impacts, but solutions. So using our voice to advocate for change I think is so important. And when we use our voice, you know, obviously we can talk about what we're doing ourselves for sure. You know, imagine if as a climate scientist talking about climate change, imagine if I flew somewhere on my private jet and then I had like a fleet of Hummers pick me up at the airport. And I was like, well, after I do this talk, I'm going to a yoga retreat in Bali on the other side of the world. You know, just to be clear, no scientist could ever do that, <laughs> not on a scientist's salary. But even if I could, even if I were, you know, Elon Musk or somebody like that, I wouldn't want to because that would be living exactly the opposite of the way I was talking. So instead, I like to talk about the fact that, you know, I drive a little plug-in hatchback and I love the solar panels our husband, my husband surprised us with for Christmas a couple of years ago. And I reduce our food waste. It's such a basic thing that anybody can do. You save money and you cut your carbon footprint. I look for locally sourced meat and I've greatly reduced our meat consumption because that's the biggest part of many people's carbon footprint. I totally changed the way I do my travel too, because that was the biggest part of my personal footprint. But if I only did that and I never talked about it, if a young girl who is scared to death of climate change and convinced her family to stop flying and to live the lowest carbon life, if that's the only thing she had done too, nobody would ever know. But she did one more thing. She took this piece of white cardboard. She painted a few words on it, school strike for climate. She used her voice. She went, she sat outside a building. And now many people in the world do know her name and her name is Greta. What do we know her for, for talking about it? Why are we talking? Because I talk about it. Talking about it is so powerful. And that is how, just think of famous individuals in history, especially in, mo in modern society. How did they act as an inflection point? What are they known for? They're known for having a dream, like Martin Luther King. That was his speech. They are known for standing up for what they believe, like Nelson Mandela. They are known for speaking truth powerfully to power, like Bishop Tutu. They're known for using their voices. Our voice is a massively underestimated agent of change, and we all have a voice that we can use in some way. Um, I have one more question at the risk of uh, veering back toward doom and gloom, um, but I do want people to um, hear also that the, from a climate scientist what is at stake if we sit on our hands and do nothing? What might happen to our societies, mm -hmm. to individuals, uh, you know, economies or individual incomes? Um, what does climate change look like when it's running rampant? Well, that's part of rational hope. That's part of understanding how bad it is and therefore how much we can avoid in the future if we make smart decisions now. So rather than just saying, you know, it's like a train that's gonna run you over no matter what, like, you know, those old cartoons where there's already somebody tied up screaming on the track and the train was bearing down on them, there was nothing they could do. That's not the way it is. We actually have a choice, we have an agency. In that scenario, we are not lying on the track in front of the train, we have our hand on the accelerator of the train. And we see something coming and scientists are saying, look, we have a little bit better eyesight than the rest of the population. There's a giant curve coming up in the road. If we barrel towards that curve at full speed, we are going to run off the rails. But the more we start to decelerate and the faster we do it, the better off we'll be and the more safely we're going to be able to negotiate this massive curve. So as John Holdren said, who was President Obama's science advisor, he said, we have three choices. We can reduce our emissions that are driving the problem. We can adapt or prepare for the impacts of a changing climate, or we can suffer, he said. And he went on, he said, we are going to do some of each. The only question now is how much, because the more we reduce our emissions, the less adaptation is required and the less suffering there will be. The planet will survive. It's not about saving the planet as if, you know, this ball of rock won't be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It's about our civilization and many other vulnerable species from polar bears to frogs 
our civilization is built on the assumption of a stable climate. Over the last six to 8,000 years, we've had some regional variations, but at the global level, our climate has been as stable as that of the human body. You know, our temperature goes up and down a few tenths of a degree over the day, right? But if our body temperature goes up by one or two degrees Fahrenheit, then we know that we're running a fever. We know that there's something wrong. In the same way, our Earth's temperature has already increased by one degree Celsius, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. It's running a fever and we're starting to feel the impacts. And we care about them, not just because of the polar bear, but because of us. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Since the 1980s, it's estimated that uh, climate change has led to about $5 billion worth in crop losses every year on average. Mo many of them are occurring in poor countries where people already live off you know, the equivalent of one or $2 a day. Since the 1960s, climate change has increased the gap between the world's richest and poorest countries by as much as 25% in some places. We see in the United States that the damage caused by extreme weather events has been increasingly increasing relentlessly decade by decade. Now, some of that is simply because we have you know, more coastal homes and more things at risk, of course. The more infrastructure we have, the more we stand to lose. But when you account for that, it's not just that. It's the fact that the climate risks are increasing. In Florida, they've already seen that coastline homes, their value has dropped already 7% compared to their inland neighbors. In the Carolinas, they've already lost billions of dollars worth in property value because of rising seas. We're seeing these impacts already in the place where we live. And in the future, some additional amount of impacts are inevitable. It's like we've been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for years and we're, we're experiencing some of those impacts today, but we don't have emphysema, we don't have lung cancer, and we're not dead. <laughs> so the time to act is now. Why? To save ourselves. Because if we don't fix climate change, it will fix us. Um, That's like a good go. point. Sorry, I, no, I was just going to jump in, Katie, and say that maybe it's time to go to, to Rita's questions and I'll ask one but you, you should dig into them and and um, and have a look uh, and pick some out but I'll, I'll just begin with one um, this is an interesting one given your given your comment about scaring the pants off people not being a sensible idea what do you Catherine think about extinction rebellion mm. well whenever we talk about the risks of climate change it's important first of all it is important to talk about the risks because if we don't think there are risks, why would we do anything about it? So it is important to talk about the risks, but we have to do so in two very important ways. And I don't always see this in climate messaging in general, but I hate to, to draw a line around any specific organization because I've seen people in Extinction Rebellion do this and I've seen them not do it. I've seen people here in the US do it and not do it. So the first key is to make the impacts relevant, relevant in space, relevant in time and relevant in interest. Not talking about things far away, but talking about what's happening where we live. If we live out west, talking about the wildfires. If we live on the Gulf Coast, talking about the hurricanes and sea level rise too. If we live in the Midwest, they were under massive flood a year and a half ago that we hardly even think about anymore, but that was just a year and a half ago. And we know climate change has already increased the risk of heavy rainfall in the Midwest by about 40% or more. Uh, if we live almost anywhere, the extreme heat waves we get. So Key number one is to make the impacts local and relevant, things that we care about, talking to farmers about crops, talking to outdoor enthusiasts about what they enjoy, talking about to people who live where we live about what's happening where we live. And then number two is to always present that information paired with what we can do, always. Because action is the antidote to anxiety and despair. And there's even a fantastic TED talk by a psychologist called Renee Lertzman, who talks about how it's important to express how we feel, but that action is what actually gives us that sense of active hope, that courage to continue, really. And if we present the risks without what we can do about it, we're actually doing people a disservice because what can you do if the train's bearing down on you and you think you're lying on the track and you're going to get run over? I would rather not know about that. Thank you. I would rather be looking the other way until it hit me, I was gone. Whereas if we present people with the information that their hand 
is on that accelerator in some way or that they are at least in the cabin with the engineer and they can influence the pathway of that train and we give them something they can do to influence it and we give them examples of other people who are acting so we don't feel like we're alone we tell them who else is doing it. And that's why movements are so powerful because we have a community of people together. We're built to, to function in community, not just as lone rangers, most of us. Then that can provide the efficacy and hope that effectively counters the doom and gloom that would otherwise turn into anxiety and it would turn into despair. And it even eventually turns into dissociation. People just fall off the cliff because we, we can't maintain that despair long-term. We've talked about individual actions. We've talked about government actions, but I want to um, ask on behalf of a reader about um, private sector and companies and um, how institutional investors or you, you know the, the private sector can be playing a part in this, what role they should be playing um, in the climate challenge, uh, what you see as priorities. Sure. Uh, so I think everybody has a role to play. So public, private, nonprofit, individuals, organizations, government, everybody has a role to play. What is the role of the private industry? Well, just yesterday, I was on a panel with the CEO of uh, Unilever, which is a very large corporation that we mostly haven't heard of, but they produce, for example, Hellman's mayonnaise. And he said, the CEO said something very powerful. He said, any company that doesn't have a plan to go carbon neutral is irresponsible. And he's been part of developing the environmental sustainability goals by which companies can actually be measured. So companies are constantly being measured. They constantly have standards that they're being measured by. In the past, most of those standards have simply been financial. But those finances have been at the cost of our finite planet. So we've been acting not just for decades, but for hundreds and even thousands of years, we've been acting as if our planet were infinite, as if there were infinite resources to be extracted, and as if there were infinite places to put our waste, which include our heat trapping gases too, as well as our plastic waste and everything. And when there were only you know, hundreds of thousands and then millions of people on the planet, it effectively was infinite. If you ran out of land, you know, the Vikings felt like they had too many people, so they encouraged them to move to Greenland. It wasn't actually green at the time, but nobody figured that out until they got there and then it was too late. Um, the Europeans um, colonized America and we're still dealing with the aftermath of that today. People spread across the world and until a couple of hundred years ago, there was somewhere new to go. And even today we have people saying, oh, well, there's Mars. But terraforming Mars and populating it with humans is, as the Royal Astronomer of England said when I asked him about this, he said, it is a dawdle in the park to fix climate change compared to terraforming Mars. So what the CEO of Unilever was pointing out is he was pointing out the fact that we have to start living within our boundaries or our limits with a circular economy instead of one that just goes on infinitely assuming that there's always more. And so having different metrics that measure not only economic growth, but also the sustainability, the ability to live within our boundaries, we need a different paradigm for business and it's business leaders and business experts and business thinkers who have to be involved in developing that paradigm. We each have our own expertise and that means we each have something unique to contribute to this. To that question, um, we have another reader asking, um, you know, how long can we expect the emissions today to be in the atmosphere? Um, and and is there any solution to that? I, you know, I ask it after the private sector question because I know that the private sector is somewhat involved in this. Yes, it depends on which gas you're talking about. So about 65% of human-caused climate change comes from carbon dioxide. And that comes from digging up and burning fossil fuels, also from deforestation. But then about 18% of it comes from methane. Methane comes from animal agriculture, from wastewater treatment, and from natural gas that leaks out of pipelines and wells. And it turns out there's quite a bit of that. And then there's some other gases, including some of the gases that contributed to destroying the ozone hole as well. So for example, methane has a pretty short lifetime in the atmosphere because it chemically reacts in the atmosphere. So after about 12 years, that's how long the methane lasts. And so reducing methane emissions, we can get a big bang for our buck because methane is 35 times stronger than CO2 
but it lasts a shorter time. So if we want quick action to reduce warming, we focus on methane. And methane is natural gas, actually. And so when you burn it, you turn it into CO2, which decreases its effect by 35 times. So 10 years ago, I actually did a study saying that, hey, this would be a great thing for the US to do first. Now we don't have that luxury. We need to do everything now. We have to cut our carbon too as soon as possible. And with carbon, it gets taken out of the atmosphere through the carbon cycle. So it gets taken up by the ocean, by the biosphere, by the soils. And that takes anywhere from tens to ultimately thousands of years. So if all of us humans disappeared off the planet today, and if hypothetical aliens appeared in 10,000 years on the planet, they would be able to tell from what we call the isotopic signature of CO2 in the atmosphere, they would be able to tell that something sentient had been on the planet massively disrupting the carbon cycle 10,000 years from now. So then you might say, well, is there any hope? That's the most depressing thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> what are you doing talking about hope and then saying we've disrupted the carbon cycle for thousands of years? Well, that's because carbon in the soil and in the biosphere is a good thing. Carbon in the atmosphere, too much of it is like an extra blanket around the planet, causing us to run a fever. But carbon in the soil is, as one agriculture professor said, he said it's like miracle grow on steroids. So smart farming techniques and Project Drawdown, if you haven't heard of Project Drawdown, you can find it online at drawdown.org. They describe all types of regenerative agriculture, permaculture, no-till agriculture, techniques to increase soil health, increase productivity, and put carbon in the soil that is not a magic, you know, silver bullet to fix the whole problem. But if you implement it around the world, you could maybe take care of about 10 to 20 percent of the problem through massive efforts to reforest, to conserve forests, and to put carbon in the soil. So it isn't all over. There's things that we can do. If the U.S. wanted to cut its carbon emissions, it's estimated that we could cut carbon emissions 50 percent, 50 percent, just through efficiency. And then the rest would have to be clean energy with some lifestyle choices. We learned this year we don't have to fly everywhere that we used to. It's actually better to sleep in your own bed sometimes and just do this via Zoom like we're doing today. But then we can also draw down the carbon and put some of it into the soils, put some of it into trees through tree planting. Again, not a silver bullet. It won't fix the whole problem, but it helps. Every bit helps. And if we put together the suite of solutions, we can also do a lot of other things like cleaning up our air, cleaning up our water, providing green jobs, improving our health, which as we talked about is something that matters to all of us, providing better habitat for animals to reduce the risk of zoonosis, which is the process by which viruses jump from animal populations to humans, which happened in the case of coronavirus. So there's all kinds of short-term benefits that would cause our human brain to move forward rather than back when we talk about real climate solutions. And Drawdown does a great job of laying those out. What about carbon capture? We hear a lot about carbon capture, but it's not yet deployed. Is that, do you have thoughts about whether it's it's really possible to be grabbing carbon dioxide from the air or from an emission source and storing it away ourselves? Hmm. It is possible. The technology definitely exists and it exists in two different ways. One is you burn coal or natural gas, but before that exhaust goes into the atmosphere, you run it through a filter that collects the CO2. That's the first way you can do it. And then the second way you can do it is you can actually suck it out of the atmosphere and then turn it into something. You can suck it out of the atmosphere through very low tech ways like growing algae. Algae feeds off CO2. And so that's a very low tech way to do it. Or you can do it a very high tech way like the Swiss company Climworks does, where they actually suck carbon out of the atmosphere and they figured out, they partnered with a company from British Columbia to figure out how to turn it into fuel liquid fuel. So we can use though that liquid fuel in internal combustion engines, but it's effectively carbon neutral because it's using carbon we took out of the atmosphere. And they've also done that with algae. You can turn algae into biofuel. You can use that biofuel in a normal airplane even, or a normal truck. You can use agricultural waste and turn that into biofuel. And there's companies like REG in Iowa that are doing that. They're collecting waste that would be thrown out, including used cooking oil. And they're turning that into fuel that can be put in regular long haul trucks today to massively reduce their carbon emissions. So we can do that. And all of that really does make a difference. But then you might say, well, why aren't we doing it? 
There's one reason we're not doing it. It looks like this and it has a line through it. <laughs> That's the reason. We don't have a price on carbon in the US. So there's no financial benefit to do it. And if the product you produce is much more expensive, like the biofuel you produce is much more expensive than regular fuel, people are not incentivized to buy it. So if you produce a product with it, or if you do something healthy, like you're putting it in the soil, you're putting it in trees, that's great. But in Texas, they have a plant called Petronova that burns natural gas. They have an experimental carbon capture on one of the turbines, just one of them out of, I think, nine. And you know what they do with the CO2? They re-inject it into oil and gas wells to increase oil and gas recovery. So that isn't reducing CO2, right. not at all. It's actually increasing CO2, most likely. It's hard to crunch the numbers, but they're definitely not strongly on the positive side there. So carbon capture is often touted, in my experience, by people who want to keep coal going, which is no longer cost efficient anyways. We've been using it for hundreds of years, and it's just outdated. It's like using a horse and a buggy and a rotary phone in 2020. It's being touted by people like that who want to keep fossil fuels going to put a little bit of lipstick on the pig, so to speak. And when that's the case, it's not going to help us. But there really are legitimate ways to do it that would make a difference. But in order for them to be cost effective, we need a price on carbon like they have, for example, in Canada. Um, so to this question of statistics and back to the science, um, this mm -hmm. is from a reader. Um, so many, so many conversations that we have, including this one, and you know, pretty much every story I've ever written on the topic deals in statistics, probabilities, yes. um, and we all know that these statistics and probabilities can be tweaked or manipulated um, for any given purpose, um, given whatever you put into it, whatever you put out. Um, in other words, there's a built-in doubt among people about statistics when they see it. They want to make sure that. You know they rattled the cage and and and, and it, or you know that it that it holds up it holds water mm -hmm. so is there something um with that way of communication in terms of probability and i know this is basically how scientists communicate right they scientists won't necessarily say this is definitely happening this is definitely not happening or yes no black white um does that way of talking in science involving probability statistics um hamper our understanding? Is that is that part of our obstacle, I guess? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. We scientists always speak in ranges, always. So let me give you an example. I said earlier how our best estimate is that about 40% of the rain during Hurricane Harvey would not have occurred if the same hurricane had happened 100 years ago. The range on that is something, I don't recall exactly, but something like 15% to 60% is the range. So when you look at the scientific paper, it always has the, the best estimate and the range so you can see what that looks like. But what we found, and I actually talk about this in the National Climate Assessment in the chapter that I wrote with my colleague Bob Kopp called Potential Surprises, what we have found is that science tends to err on the side of, as one study called it, least drama. So the fact that when we produce assessments like the IPCC or the National Climate Assessment, all the scientists have to agree on something before they sign off on it means that we tend to agree on the lowest common denominator. So we tend to see already things are starting to happen faster than we thought. And they're starting to happen above the average value more towards the top end of that range of probabilities. So in our community, I feel like that range has done people a bit of a disservice because we don't like emphasizing the tail of the range because we're called alarmist, we're called chicken little, we're called the boy who, who cried wolf. So we scientists prefer to be conservative. It's our nature. But I've been working with engineers for a number of years, infrastructure engineers. So people who design bridges and roads and highways and culverts and ditches. And the biggest lesson we learned in a year of working together was that an engineer's definition of conservative is exactly the opposite of a climate scientist's. An engineer's definition of conservative is the worst case scenario times two or four, or if they're very conservative, 10, because human lives are at risk. So being conservative is being as careful as possible. Whereas to a climate scientist, being conservative is the best case scenario. 
you know, low climate sensitivity, low emissions, everybody figures out what to do. So I think that the engineers have it right. Because if it's human life that's at stake, if it's human civilization that's at stake, and that is what really is at stake, shouldn't we be erring on the side of making sure we really will be okay, rather than just giving ourselves a 50-50 chance of making it? Catherine, thank you so much um, for your time today. We really appreciate your joining us. Um, great to hear about the science. Also great to hear um, that there are, there are cause, causes for hope. Um, clearly communication is a huge part of that. And so from all of us at Reuters, thank you for, for coming on. And thanks too to those people watching and those people who sent in questions. I know there were a lot of questions. We got to some of them, not all of them. Um, please do join us for our next Reuters Newsmaker. Look out for, for what's coming up. And thank you uh, from us today. Goodbye. <laughs>